Go's concurrency model is composed of only a few simple parts that are combined to create sophisticated yet elegant flows. In this video, we'll explore concurrency in Go from the ground up using examples of working code, each building on the last. We'll start with the non-concurrent code you see now and evolve it one example at a time to see how each of Go's concurrency components build on top of one another. This simple example shows three processes being run sequentially, each taking a second. If we run this code, we'll see each task start, finish a second later, then the next task immediately start. We can begin adding concurrency to this by introducing Go routines to process each of our tasks in parallel. We'll start by removing the three process function invocations and replacing them with a range over a slice of task strings, inside which we have an anonymous function and inside that is our process function. The Go keyword in front of our anonymous function is how we tell Go to run the given function concurrently. We could give the Go keyword our process function without the anonymous function, but we're going to need it shortly. If we run this code now, we'll see our start and complete messages with nothing from the process function. This is because the main function continued running after it started the Go routines and returned before they could complete their work. To prevent this, we're going to introduce another concurrency feature called wait groups. We'll create a wait group variable from the sync package and call its wait function after the Go routines are started. This will make the application wait until the Go routines have all completed before continuing execution. We'll tell the wait group how many Go routines it needs to wait for and then have each Go routine tell the wait group it's done. Let's run this and see how it looks. This one runs much quicker with each task starting at the same time and finishing at the same time. We've just tripled the speed of our application. This example doesn't have any result being returned to the main function. If we did want that, we need to introduce another of Go's concurrency features called channels. We'll start by removing the wait group from our code, create a channel using the make function and defer the closure of the channel. We'll then update the signature of our process function to take the channel as an argument and inside the process function we'll replace our final print statement with the same text being written to the channel. After creating our Go routines, we'll range over our tasks again, this time creating a variable called result, reading the contents of our channel and finally printing it. If we run this code, we get the exact same output as last time, but the code is quite different. Let's take a look. The key thing to note here is that returning a result from a Go routine doesn't use a normal return statement. Instead, the channel allows us to pass data between Go routines. The arrow operator is used to interact with a channel. The arrow on the left means we're reading from the channel and on the right means we're writing to it. When passing a channel to a function, using the arrow in the signature is an optional way to define the channel as read or write only. Omitting the arrow and passing a bidirectional channel is like using the any type, unclear and potentially dangerous. In our previous code, we had a wait group ensuring the caller function didn't exit before all the go routines were complete. We still have that same problem when using channels, but we solve it differently. When we write some code to read from a channel, execution of the code will block until there is something in the channel to be read. Values in a channel are removed as they are read. When writing to a channel, the same thing happens in reverse. If there's a value in the channel waiting to be read, the function will block until the channel is empty. These single value channels are one of two types of channel Go has to offer known as unbuffered channels. The other type, buffered channels, allows us to write multiple values into a queue. For this example, we'll start by modifying the creation of our channel to specify a size. This is the number of values it can hold before further attempts to write to it block. We'll reintroduce the wait group from our earlier example. It'll behave the same as it did previously, with one difference. We're going to place the wait function inside another Go routine, along with a deferred call to close our channel. Placing these two lines inside the Go routine ensures our channel gets closed once the Go routines have told the wait group they are done. With the Go routines complete and the channel closed, we can range over the channel and print each result. Note we don't need the arrow syntax this time. Running this code gives us the same output as our previous two examples. Next, we'll introduce control flow for our Go routines and channels using the select statement. We'll modify the range over our tasks to get the current index and pass it to the process function as the task duration after incrementing it. 
We'll use the after function from the time package to create two channel variables in our process function, timeout and task done. The after function takes a duration and returns a channel, which will have a value written to it once the duration has elapsed. We'll add a select statement to our process function to handle the timeout channel. A select statement is a switch statement that deals exclusively with channels. It evaluates all cases and executes the one that has a value on the channel waiting to be read. If multiple cases have channels waiting to be read, it picks one at random. If none of the channels have a value, it either executes the default statement, which we are not including here, or blocks until there is something to read. We'll add two cases to our select, one for if the timeout is reached and one for if the task duration is reached. We don't care about what's on either channel, so we'll just send our timeout or finished message to the results channel. Returning to our main function, we'll range over our tasks and read the value from the channel before printing it. If we run this code now, we'll see something slightly different from before. All three tasks start as normal, and the first two finish as normal, but the third one doesn't, and instead we are told the timeout has been reached. We've implemented a timeout here, using functions from the time package. But there's another way we can time out a go routine, and that is using a context. We'll move our timeout variable into the main function and convert it from a channel to a duration. We'll then create a context and a cancel function with the timeout variable. We'll defer running the cancel function to ensure all running go routines get cancelled and cleaned up if they're still running when the main function exits or panics. We'll modify our process function to take the context as an argument. Inside the process function, we'll modify our select statement to replace the timeout channel with the done function of the context. The channel returned by this function will have a value written to it when the timeout is reached. Running this code gives us the same output as the previous example where we used the timeout channel. Go routines, channels and select statements combine to form one of Go's two ways of writing concurrent code, and ideal if you want to coordinate different Go routines as they pass and transform data between themselves. If you want to share a single piece of data between multiple Go routines, then a mutex is a better option. We'll illustrate this with a new example. Let's create a new type called inventory manager, which will have a map of strings to integers as the inventory, and a mutex. We'll see how the mutex works shortly as we complete the example. We'll attach two functions to our inventory manager type, update and read. When we update a value, we first lock the mutex, defer the unlock, and then write our new value. Read is very similar. We lock the mutex, defer the unlock, read the specified value, and return it. When we lock the mutex, any other Go routine that tries to access the inventory will block until the mutex is unlocked. Here is the equivalent code written using channels. The mutex based approach is much shorter and elegant than the channel based one. And that's an overview of Go's concurrency model. If you made it this far and found it useful, why not leave a like on the video? It helps a lot more than you might think.